to Grace Chapel, the best is the best. There's no better place to be than to be in God's house. We cross over one more time. Good morning, Grace. Good morning. It's scripture ready time. If you have a Bible, you want to open to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. We're reading verse 14, 15, and 16. Are we there? Somebody said, wait a minute. Are we there? From the King James Version, it said, Yea, the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bush, but on a candlestick, and it give a light unto all that are in the house. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven yes, the word of God for the people of God amen, amen. God be praised today yes. you may be seated yes. I'm about to sing a song that I actually I really love this song I'm not trying to warn you to heaven. I'm not trying to force you to go to heaven. I'm not trying to convince you to want to go to heaven, but I'm going to tell you that it's going to rain. Long time ago, God told Noah, he said, listen, it's going to rain, but they didn't believe. But I'm telling you now, it's going to rain. Might not be rain this time, might not be water this time. It's going to be fire this time. Bye. 
Father, you know what our individual needs are. You know what we're dealing with. You know our thoughts and our intentions. Father, today, we cast all of our carols on you because you care for us. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, that we may have life and life more abundantly. Father, as we learn in this series how to come out of the spirit of darkness, and Father, today we're going to learn how to walk like Jesus, because we know if we walk like Jesus, we're going to walk in love. We're going to serve one another. We will put down the attitudes and all those things that can come against the goodness of God. Father, we praise your holy name. We magnify you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that no weapon formed against your people shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against your people, Father, it's our responsibility to condemn it, not receive it, rebuke it, return it to the pit of hell where it comes from. Because, Lord, your word tells us that our righteousness comes from you. We know we are nothing but dirty, filthy rags before you, Lord. We all have sinned and fall short of your glory. Have your way today, Father, as the word comes forth. Your word is alive and powerful and it cannot return forward. We praise you for that, Lord. Bless the man of the hour, Father, that we hear from you, Lord. Father, go into deep, dark places in our lives and bring us up that we may walk boldly and spiritually in the kingdom of God. Have your way today. We thank you in advance what you're going to do for us, Lord. In the name of Jesus, and everybody say, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Claim your milk. Claim it. Claim your, your mental distress. Claim it. Claim your healing in every area of your life. Hallelujah. Are you glad to be here today? Let me make you a promise from the get-go of this sermon is that Josh Sigler is not here to change you because I cannot change you. I'm not here to offer you a Benz or some fancy car. Tesla here, right? I'm not, offer, I'm not here to offer you or bribe you with riches. I'm here to stand next to you as we seek Jesus together. Yeah, yeah. Because if you come to a man or woman, as much as we love you at grace, we're going to fail you. We're going to let you down. But if we come together to Jesus, he will never let you down. He will never fail. You know, I'm a human being. Some of you are filling that out. I promise not to pick on Sister Janice, but she's sitting up here. She let me know two things this morning. She was so glad to see me. Good morning, Chaplain Ziggler. And then she wants to know where, why haven't you responded to my text yet? Sister Janice, I'm going to fail you. But we serve a God that does not fail. Men's Choir, thank you so much for ushering us into the presence of God. You know, in our worship, we set the tone that our hearts can be open. Let me, let me share that a different way. During worship, it gives us an excuse to put our cell phone down, put our grocery list away, and to focus on Jesus. Amen? Amen. You can send me a tweet later. Let's focus on Jesus then. Amen. I'll also admit to you that I had to threaten Chaplain Johnson after last week's sermon. I told him that if he keep preaching like that, he couldn't PC us anywhere. Guy. Man. It goes to show what will happen when you preach the word of truth 
when you operate in the anointing that God has given you, and you apply some skill craft to what God is doing. Amen? Amen. Why does, why does Chaplain Ziegler mention these things? Because these are the things that you are hopefully seeing, and these are the things that we want to help awaken in your life. The calling that God has given you, the passion that God has given you, as you apply it to the Word of God and you put your feet to faith. Today, we're going to continue as best I can, Chaplain Johnson, <laughs> looking at the epistle of 1 John. We've been talking about out of darkness. Just in case you're not familiar, you haven't been with us in the last few weeks. During the month of March, we've talked about leaving our captivity, leaving Egypt. Egypt is an example of a, a reference, uh, an analogy of enslavement, looking for deliverance in Jesus Christ. As we leave March, as we leave the understanding of Resurrection Sunday, we don't just get to Resurrection Sunday and that's it. It's a continuing process. And John reminds us today that if we are going to walk with God, we're going to walk in the light. And as we continue this week, we need to be able to get to a place, we were invited to a place that we can walk as Jesus walked. So we're going to look at 1 John, we're going to read John, 1 John chapter 2, 1 through 11. Excuse me, 3 through 11. If you're able to stand, feel free to. If you're not, read along with us. In the NIV, your scripture may be a little different. Your version may be a little different. It says this. We, meaning Christians, know that we come to know him because we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk. Say that with me. Walk. walk. As Jesus did. Yes. Verse 7. Dear friends, I'm writing to you a new command. Not a new command. But a let me start over since I got that wrong. Dear friends, I am not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command, we'll explain that in a bit, is the message that you have heard. Yet I am writing to you a new command. Its truth is seen in him, in you, because the darkness is passing. Say that with me, is passing. Yeah. And the true light is already shining. Ooh, it's hard to keep reading. You want to preach right there. Last few verses. Here we go. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his or her brother lives in the light. And there's nothing in that person to make him stumble. Last verse. But whoever hates his brother is in yeah. darkness yeah. Yeah. and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Woo, you may be seated if you can. Who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. This is directly connected to your and my salvation. Let me put it another way. I don't save myself. I'm not sure why Brother Smith just said amen so loudly, but I don't save myself. My salvation is sourced outside of me. Oh, come on, church. Come, first John isn't new to you. Salvation comes outside of myself. We'll catch up. The Bible says, and we stand on this word, that Jesus is the way, he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the light. No one comes to the Father. No one gets to heaven 
No one walks to the other side. No one crosses over the Jordan. No one goes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. Now we're excited about that because those same words that condemn us set us free. That if Judge Ziegler can't save himself, Jesus will. If Judge Ziegler can't gain his salvation, God has to give it to him. If I can't do it myself, God has made a way. And he is the way. You see, some deny, this is a little bit of piggyback off of Chaplain Johnson, so I may be stealing some of his material. Well, come on. See, some deny salvation's existence. Because if I cannot attain salvation, then there's no reason for me to seek after it. Some deny hell's existence because if hell doesn't exist, there's no reason why I shouldn't do all the things I want to do. Some deny Jesus ever came to this earth because if Jesus doesn't exist, there's no reason that I cannot be my own God, do my own thing, live my own life. Some redefine who Jesus is because if I can change Jesus' character, then I cannot be held accountable for my sin. Some, anybody ever heard the word Genesis? Now, some of you are already having PTSD from that comment because you think I'm talking about the medical field. Some of you in the army, you know, and, and you connected to Genesis. You're like, oh, no, Genesis. So now I'm not talking about that Genesis. I'm talking about the original Genesis, the beginning Genesis. If you go to the first few chapters in the Bible, you see that the first lie in the Bible was old Slewfoot, Satan himself, convinces Adam and Eve to reinterpret the word of God. Hmm. Is that really what he said? Is that really what God said? Is that really in God's word? I don't know. That's uncomfortable. I don't like that. Let's go to something else. Oh, you know, he didn't really mean that. That's not what God meant. Thou shalt not. No, no, he meant, no, he meant something else. Let's reinterpret that. Let's go to a different version so I can find out what it means what I like. You're taking it too literal. God's not the way. He's our way. Not the truth. Right? It's an optional. John is talking to the people of the church. But listen, this isn't a sermon to the PX. This isn't a commanding staff where he's talking to the people that are in charge. He's talking to the church. That if you reinterpret who Jesus is, there is no salvation. Reinterpreting who Jesus is is the method that has been used to protect ourselves from feeling convicted and justify our sinful actions. You don't have to say amen, but I appreciate that. You don't have to raise your hand, but I'll raise both. <laughs> That's me, amen? amen. Oh, well, you know, I, I don't feel like it today. Ooh. I'd rather not do that thing that God's commanding me. I'm yeah, sorry, it's, it's all right. I'll just keep going. Here we go. Reinterpreting what Jesus said and who Christ is has even been used to claim supernatural knowledge that is superior to other Christians and even superior to our church forefathers. Let me share a secret with you. I am not going to tell you anything about God that I have not learned from someone else. What are you talking about? Where do you think I got Jesus from? Did I just make him up myself? Did I just open up, I mean, did I just choose any scripture and just start reading and become saved? No. Like many of you, like many of you, whether physically or spiritually, my parents gave me the word of God. Now you know what they didn't do? John and Brenda Ziegler didn't save me. John and Brenda Ziegler didn't save me. They added to my salvation. They set me up. We can't save our kids. It's like my parents can't save me. But you know what they did is they passed on spiritual DNA. Right, right, right. All too often in the world in which we exist in, now we're talking army stuff, now we're talking military stuff, 
Well, we don't want to, we, we don't want to force people to believe anything. They'll just pick it up and they'll choose. No, that's hogwash. If you don't give a child a starting point, they'll never grow. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say is when mom and dad bring you home, they feed you. They give you a bottle, physical nourishment. They raise you in a place that's warm, not cold. Even if you're from Wisconsin, they warm you up. <laughs> what they don't do is they say, you know what? We'll just let them get to 18. They'll decide how to feed themselves. They'll decide how to clothe themselves. No, that's chaos and anarchy. It is a lie from Satan himself. The struggle is many of us today, we've grown up without any spiritual direction. Come on, Ziggler, what point are you going to? The point is, is that we, Josh Ziggler, we did not come to Jesus by ourselves. God made a path. God made a way. So if I'm speaking a gospel other than what my parents, physical or spiritual parents, gave me, I am in error. I am wrong. No, I'm not saying that sometimes my parents aren't right. I'm not saying that my parents have always got the right theological answer. But you know what? Who's always right? Jesus Christ. Yes. 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 It's, it's, I mean, maybe we need an act to that. I don't know. Maybe we need to, to tweet it. <laughs> See, the thing is this. Is that our world tries to tell us we need all this other stuff. And stuff is good. I like stuff. I'm a scuba guy. I got lots of stuff. My poor wife. We have shoes and stuff for scuba. That's all we have. I like stuff. Yeah. But stuff is not important. When we make what is not priority the priority, then we're in chaos. Jesus is the way, the truth. He's not a way. We don't get to, you know, we don't go to, we don't leave this world, this world, and go to eternity and say, okay, uh, are we going to the Buddhist heaven? Are we going, would you like to go into this heaven, to that heaven? No, there's only one! There's only one way to get there! But what happens is, in John chapter 1, we have people that are trying to prove their worth. And they're trying to do a good thing, they're trying but they've become blinded by their own self-righteousness yes. instead of becoming righteous in Jesus Christ. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. All right, I think it's been good so far. We'll find out. See, the New Testament churchgoers, they were evangelizing. The church was growing. Amen? Yes. People's lives were being changed. Yes. The world was being stood on its head. And yet... In a misguided attempt to connect with God, those who received the gift of salvation began to spread a gospel that reinterpreted who Jesus is. So let me put it in a matter of fact from this pulpit. If anyone preaches a gospel other than what's in the word of God from this pulpit or anywhere else, it is useless, it is void, and I hope you scream us off the platform. Because the word of God that is not centered in Jesus Christ is not a word of God. That's why we continue to come back, Old Testament, New Testament, we, can com we continue to come back to the work of Christ. Because it's not the work of grace gospel. It's the work of Jesus Christ in grace gospel. How are we going to change Lewis North? This is our backyard. Just in case you don't know, you're in Lewis North. How are we going to change our, our, our backyard? It's not through just becoming more like Grace Gospel. It's becoming more like Jesus Christ. But guess who's going to bring the Gospel to them? Guess who's going to share the Gospel? But guess who's going to share the love with them? Guess who's going to invite them in? Guess who's going to put them to work and allow them to share? Grace Gospel is. Come on. But if we make Grace the priority instead of Jesus, that's it. We haven't even gotten to the scripture yet. We're just, we're just getting there, aren't we? All right. Maybe you've heard some similar views. And it's not that I'm a Christian, I'm just religious. 
no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm religious. I'm spiritual. Wow. What does that mean? I tell you what that means. That means there's a lot of confusion, but in a world that doesn't believe in Jesus, it's also given us some space. Now, real quick, there's a, there's a, there's a, a document out there, because most, many of you are, are, are army churchgoers. FM 722 talks about holistic readiness. Mm -hmm. Hold on. What that does is it doesn't tell people they need Jesus, but it does people does let people know that they're spiritual beings. And that gives us church folks to say, you want your spirit to be healthy? Let me introduce you to the person who made your spirit. But if I use the excuse that I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual, I'm denying a method. I'm denying what my parents have given me, and I'm saying I exist because I choose to exist. Well, how about this one? I have a new interpretation of that scripture. All I have to do is follow my heart. I, wait, wait, I'm just not feeling it. All right, only a few more. Because, you know, your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. Woo, ethics loves that discussion. There's only one truth, folks. Only one truth. And you know what? I'm not the truth. I serve the truth. You serve the truth. The one that we all love that's been used way back, way, way back, it's even in the Greek. You do you and I'll do me. Right? No? Not so much? No, it's a different scripture. It works, isn't it? All right, 1 John chapter 2 explores a familiar question of how do I know for sure that I am going to heaven? The one question that all of us must answer. As a very new um, college graduate, new from Central Bible College, still getting my act together, I'm sure I, I'm sure I did a horrible job, well, at least there's a lot for me to learn. I was a school teacher, Bible school teacher, and I, I challenge teenagers. And we get to challenge adults here today. We challenge teenagers that if they have not questioned whether God exists, how do they know God exists? See, I grew up in a, a Bible-believing home, a preacher's home. And all my life, I was told God exists. Worship God. Receive the Holy Spirit. Let God, the Holy Spirit move in your life. Witness, evangelize. But until I came to a place and asked do I believe this stuff or I'm just doing acts of service? Then it was just my mom and dad's religion. Not until I begin to question, is this real? And don't worry, when we question God, God will answer it. It's okay. It's not, it's not blasphemy. Questioning doesn't mean we don't have faith in him. Question doesn't mean that we don't believe in him. Question doesn't mean we're challenging his authority. It just means I'm challenging in my mind. I don't understand. But when we question him, God, is this salvation thing real? Am I going to heaven? John again, uh, John attempts to answer these questions. Says you give me a little space to drink some water. Allergies, amen? amen. Mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest equals allergies, amen. <laughs> One first thing I want to talk to you about today is the character of a Christian. The character of a Christian is obedience. I can move quickly through this, but I'm going to do my best to move powerfully through this. So we, this is what we know. We know that we have come to know him if we obey. Say obey. obey. If we obey his commands. Yeah. Hey, gentlemen, let me tell you. You want to know how to get your wife to be in love with you? Do what she asks you to do. Ah, ah, ah. Now, I didn't say do what she told you to do. Do what she asked you to do. Because if she wants chocolates and you bring her flowers, flowers are going in the trash. If she wants tulips and you bring and you bring her roses, guess what's gonna happen? Roses are not gonna make the bill. We want to know why you're lonely, cold. Spend so much time fishing. Bring her what she asked. It's not different at all when it comes to God. God accepts you, God loves you, and there's a way to obey him, follow him, obey him, and you have his full connection. If you bring him roses, and he, you, you get that one. So we have this back up in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 
15.22, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. That doesn't mean much, that doesn't mean much to most of us, right? To obey is better than sacrifice. You mean to give up stuff. No, no, no. This is what the Old Testament is saying. The Old Testament way of knowing that you were a Christian, the Old Testament way of knowing that you were connected to God, was that you brought a sacrifice to God and you killed it. You brought an innocent lamb. Perfect. What you would bring to the market. The thing that would sustain your life. You brought this perfect thing. You prayed over it. It became, it, it take on all your sins. Then you killed it. Dead. And that's the way you knew that you were good with God. So back in the day, come on church, some of you, some of you were thinking, Back in the day, the way you were good with God was to do sacrifice. And God says, I'm not worried about your sacrifice. I'm worried about you obeying me. See, some of you, you can pull out your blockbuster card. Oh, back in the day. And you say, I'm a member. Some of you can take out your account and say, look, I'm a member of this, I'm a member of that. I say, I'm not worried about your membership on card. I'm worried about your membership in your heart. And this is what John is backing up. He says to obey is what God is asking of us. In fact, he's saying, if you want to know you're a Christian, you're doing what God has asked you to do. Right. It's the opposite of what the religious want us to do. Ooh, wait a minute, what are you talking about? You're religious? Yes, I got it. We're all religious. But the super religious wants you just to obey. Just do what you're told. We're all robots in Jesus' name. That is not God. God says the evidence of who you are, the evidence of being connected to God, it will produce obedience. <laughs> so get that lady some flowers. Chapter 2, 4. I cannot say that I know Jesus if I've not been affected by him. Let me give you an example. If, uh, for those of us that we first came into the military, some of us are in the military here, um, we ask things like, uh, you won't be there at 8 o'clock, is that a.m. or p.m.? For the uninitiated, we're on a 24-hour clock. 8 o'clock's in the morning. So when, you're, when your sergeant tells you, be somewhere at 5.30, they mean really early. They don't mean like you got options. They mean they want you there at 5 o'clock in the morning waiting on them. Because if you're there at 17.30, not only are you 15 minutes late, but you're 12 hours and 15 minutes late. <laughs> Man, the Army's got its own way of doing things, right? Only its own code, its own talking. You hang around the military long enough and you start talking military code. It, you know, it's not even English anymore. It's just all code. Before you know it, your spouse looks to you and says, what's your ETA for leaving the PX? <laughs> you left the SP hours ago. We've been looking up for you around the AO. You said you would be Mike Charlie by D plus two. Where I, where I, like I used to behave. It's disruptive. 
Why? Because when Jesus infects your life, come on, not just affects, but it in, he infects your life, you begin to act differently. You can still be a scuba diver, you can still be a bowler, you can still be a fisherman, you can still go to the men's event, the ladies' event, you can still do all these different things, but you do it with Jesus Christ in form. We gotta keep going. I'm sorry. We gotta keep going. What is the marker of disobedience? What is the evidence of walking with Jesus Christ? The answer is love. Now that may seem strange from an army chaplain, who, by definition of being in the military, is war. But love is what our campaign plan is. Yes. God's love is in you if you find yourself obeying his word. It's kind of funny how the, word, how the Bible words these things, right? It's like at the end of Matthew 28, 19, 20. While you're going, baptize people. While you're walking in Jesus, you're going to find yourself being more like Jesus. And if you try to just do the things that Jesus did, it's not the same thing. Oh, come on, church. If you try to do the things, if you try to mimic the characteristics of who Jesus is, that is not going to get you what you want. It takes knowing Jesus Christ. And without knowing Jesus Christ, all we can do is mimic all we can do is come up with a new thing, with a new theory, with a new idea, so I'm not left out. So what does verse 5 tell us? Walk as Jesus walked. Yes. When you hang around Jesus, you stop to talk and walk like Jesus. Yes. If my walk isn't a little like Jesus, I probably haven't been spending a lot of time with him. Ooh. Those are my tips. Man, you say one thing, but your walk's a little funny. You know, we got some airborne folks here. We got some people that jump out of planes, but mostly you jump out of big vehicles. Like we should say airborne even when you jump out of a, out of a big old tall vehicle, right? Like, why is the thing so big? I don't know. Just to be big. Let's just go down the street. Let's just go downtown Seattle and just drive a big old, big old vehicle. Just, just for fun. It's got a purpose. You know, when people are injured, they walk funny. I'm speaking, I'm speaking from experience, amen? Yes. You're supposed to walk funny when you're injured. But when God gets a hold of your spiritual walk, you're supposed to not walk funny anymore. Right. Ziggler, what are you really saying? What I'm saying is, when people come in our service, when people come to the door that never experience grace gospel, that never experience Jesus, we expect them to be sinners. We expect people to come in and bring the world with them. We expect them to bring sin in the door with them. We don't expect the perfect to come to grace gospel. This is a hospital, not a country club. And if people bring their sin with them, then we expect their walk's going to be funny. That's why Brother Dwayne is going to get up and say, and say and talk to as many men as he can before he leaves here today and say, hey guys, come hang out with us on the fourth Saturday. We're going to do a bunch of guys stuff together and we're going to do it in the name of Jesus. Sister Levine and like every third female in here is going to walk around saying, let's hang out together on the fourth Saturday. Amen? Yeah. Why? Not because it's a social club. Because we learn together, we serve together, we grow together. Yeah. So while 
people are transitioning to the church. We expect that they will have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. But we expect that their world will begin to see Jesus in them as they transition to a lifestyle of Jesus Christ. Yes. But we can't stay there. That's double-minded. Right, right. right? Some of us have been church a long time and we still got one foot in the world. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Watch out. <laughs> Some of you are doing the splits. God didn't call you to be on the splits. He called you to put your feet on solid rock. So if you hear me this morning condemning you because you're new to grace, that's not what I'm saying. If you hear me this morning tell you that you're bad because you're a new Christian, that's not what I'm saying. If you're here today and you don't have a lifestyle of Jesus Christ, and you hear me saying that you're awful, you're bad, I think you're terrible, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that we believe in transition. We believe in transitioning from the world, and we want to offer you a better way. Not a grace way, a Jesus way. Not a Josh Simple way, a Jesus way. Not the way we used to do it, God's way. It's going to look a little bit like what we used to do it. Because we received it from someone else. Yeah. Listen, don't make hey, church. I, I, I just, I'm sorry, but I gotta stop you for a second. There is great tradition in Grace Gospel. Yeah. In fact, any gospel service you go to, there's great tradition. There's very, very strong reasons for it. Culturally, there's reasons for it because there's no other way to be yourself. There's no other way to express yourself. You are literally condemned for being who you are anywhere else. Spiritually, we are used to doing patterns, and we exchange those patterns from generation to generation. And there's nothing wrong with that. As long as we're always meeting the needs of the people that are alive today. Amen. All right, I'm going to step on my own feet. One of the worst things I can do, Brother Smith, is stand up here and say, You young people! You know what? That's a very poor way for me to say, I'm so glad you're here. I feel a little disconnected from you. But I recognize you're here. You come are on. the future. Come on. But when I point out, there you go. Come on. Come on. If all I ever do is refer to anyone as a young person, you know what I do is I, I delineate them as someone that's always a newbie, always someone that's small, always someone that's in the beginning growth. And you know what, my brothers and sisters in here today, that you're under 30, you are the future. Amen. The future is now. You are the future. If we don't have three times who you are today, there is no church in 10 years. You are the future. This is your church. Come on. This is your church. And since I'm off topic, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your input. We want to know what you need to know. We know we need to know how grace needs to change to be more productive, more compatible with our world. The message will never change. Amen. Can we move on? Is that okay? I'm watching my time. Here we go. I hope that you'll get excited about this because John tells us is that as we're leaving Egypt, as we're getting out of darkness, the darkness is passing. See, this isn't a new comment that we should love one another. This is an old thing. See, the love of God is not new. He is called God the Father, not because he beats us, not because he mistreats us, not because he hates us or puts us in a corner. But he's called God the Father because he loves us. And that's kind of hard because some of us didn't have a father that was a good father. Some of us have not had a father. God represents himself as the Father because he wants to know all good things come from him. It also says that this is, an, this is a new command. Wait a minute. What, what are you talking about? It's an old command. It's a new command. It's a new command because you know what? The new command is new when it's new to me. I became a Christian about the age of five or six years old. <coughs> your father, right? Like your cowboy, an Indian, astronaut. Me? I came to full understanding that unless I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, I'm going to hell. I'll, either that's like a, a great thing or it's like a traumatic thing. For me, it was a good thing. I received 
from God early. It was new to me when I was five. I've met chaplains, I've met Christians, I've met people from all around the world that they've come to know God when they were seven, when they were 10, when they were in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you name it. It was new to them when they received it. It also becomes new when you hear it, when you've stepped away and you've come back. You know what also becomes new? It becomes refreshed anew at the altar when we give things back over to God. It doesn't mean we forgot it, it just becomes new. But it's not a new concept that we love one another. God is love. Stick around for chapter four. We're going to hear all about this. This is important. Darkness is passing. In verse eight, it tells us that the darkness is already beginning to pass. In fact, let me go back and read it right here. It says this in verse eight. Yet I am writing to you a new command. The truth is in him, in you. Here we go. Because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. All right, Zane, what is it saying? Break it down first plainly. The darkness is passing, my friends. I don't have to find my own way. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You see, this is graduation season. Right now, people are trying to find out, am I going to be successful in life because of where I chose to go to college? What next step I go, am I going to go to the military, I'm going to trade craft. They're looking, do, do I have the guarantee of tomorrow? I have to find my own way, I have to make my own mark in the world. And to some extent, I got you. But when it comes to salvation, we don't have to find our own way. It is already here. The path that Jesus laid out is already working. I'm on my way out of Egypt. If I am on the exit ramp out of Cairo, why would I make a U-turn back into slavery? It doesn't make sense. Secret handshakes, secret knowledge, I know better than you. These things don't work. That's not the gospel. The gospel tells us that the darkness is already fading. Jesus, the light of the world, has come. I have been set free. You have been set free. When Jesus is my chauffeur, I don't need to call an Uber. I don't need to look fancy. I don't have to go to the latest app. But the latest thing doesn't free me from darkness. There is no new revelation that does not uphold what is in line with the revelation of God that was handed down to us from the prophets to the disciples, to our spiritual forefathers, and finally down to us. Amen? Amen. The everlasting, incorruptible, all-powerful work of the risen Savior is destroying the darkness in our world even today. Does that mean it's, the work is done? Does that mean our fight against this, our fight against that is done? No. What that means is we have a hope that people outside of Christianity do not have. We're not looking to see if we're going to be good enough because we're not. Christ is good enough. The way has already been paid. Lastly, in the brief few minutes that I have, I want to talk to you about those in the light are not blind. You see, in verse 9, if my walk, sorry, if my talk and my walk don't match up, then there's something either wrong with my talk or there's something wrong with my walk. One has to change. If I say we're part of the family but never show up to a reunion, if I say I'm in Christ but I never hang around Christ, Come on, friends. If I say I'm a part of God, but I live like I'm a part of the world, then my talk and my walk aren't the same. And one's got to change, because if one doesn't change, I look like a fool. I look like an idiot. I look like someone speaking out of two sides of my mouth. Either I have to change the way I live, 
or I have to reinterpret the way I believe. As Christians, we have the privilege of growing deeper and deeper in Christ. As children of God, we have the honor of drawing closer and closer in relationship to Jesus. The one thing we cannot do is reinterpret who Jesus is. So I can't change my talk, but I have to change my walk. And the beauty of it is, I see a whole arena of imperfect Christians made perfect in Christ that are still trying to walk the walk just like me. Jesus. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. I know if I'm a Christian, if I'm loving those around me, you ever seen an angry preacher? Don't, don't say anything. <laughs> you ever spend any time with a disgruntled Christian? I mean, like, they let you know they're a Christian, and then they let you know that they're disgruntled. Like, all in the same sentence. Jesus loves you, but I don't have to. <laughs> I get it, we all have bad days. But how many bad days do you have to have until it becomes a character issue? You see, if I'm grumpy 90% of the time, you talk to me, it's not because it's the problem with my environment, there's a problem with me. Maybe I'm a grumpy person. They will know that we are Christians by our love. John 13, 35. Verse 11, our final chapter here. If we continue in darkness, he does not know where he is going because the darkness is blinding him. My true character is revealed in how I impact those around me. My true character is known how I impact those around me. As our, as our band begins to give us some worship music in the background, as we begin to turn our hearts toward the altar, my character is revealed how I interact with you every day. I've said this before, and I'm afraid, but I'll say it again today. The person who knows me best other than Jesus Christ is my wife. I live with her every day. She can speak to my character. Not how I preach on Sunday. Not how I do on the 9, 10, 14 hours a day of work I do. She sees me day in and day out. And God sees us day in and day out. See, the worst thing about this is at times that we say that we're in the light and we're actually living in darkness. See, if I respond to folks with darkness, hear me, please hear me. If I respond to folks with darkness, then darkness is in me. Oh no, I haven't bad. No, there was darkness escaping. It was coming out of me. See, darkness is simply spilling. The darkness that is there is simply spilling out. I'm not condemning you. No, I'm not telling you you're terrible. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that we're here today and we need to know that when we spill darkness, it's not because it was created in us by somebody else. The darkness is in here, and we need to have some heart surgery. Because the worst thing about this is at times, I don't see the mirror, and my wife sees me, and she says, Hey, what you're saying, what you're doing, what you got on is not appropriate. And I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit does that for you and me, because my wife can't be everywhere with you and me all the time. The Holy Spirit checks us and says, You know what? Is your life in line? Jesus Christ. I didn't ask you, are you perfect like Jesus? I know the answer to that. I didn't ask you, do you love me as much as Jesus? I think you don't have a chance. What I said is, is that the Holy Spirit will quicken our hearts. And he will remind us, are your actions lining up 
to obedience in Jesus Christ. Today we ask the Lord, Lord, help me to see. Help me not to be blind. We have a tradition in the Christian church that says, Lord, I believe. Help me to believe. Today, some of us, it's been a while since we've been to the optometrist. Our prescription has begun to run low. Our prescription not as powerful as it used to be. This altar right here is a place where God can adjust our eyes. You might hear leave. You might leave here with a little bit of Grace branding on your glasses. Your contacts may be, you know, made in China, not China, made in God, made in the gospel service. But its origins is in Jesus Christ. This is what I offer you today, young, old, veteran, new to the, new to here. I offer you, give us a chance. You come hang out with us. We'll do our best to give you Jesus. Not as a threat, but as an honest, broken individual to another honest, broken individual. We will do our best to give you Jesus. So that when you leave here, you know that you're loved. You know that we have plenty of mothers, plenty of fathers, plenty of aunts and uncles that want to stand by us and grow together. But we can't grow in darkness. We can't grow, we cannot live in darkness. So the altar call, my time where we allow people to pray with us and God to change us so that we can grow further.